Good morning and welcome to worship. Woodlawn Without Walls. I'm Pastor Lori and it's a joy to be worshiping with you today on whatever device you're watching at whatever time you're watching. We'll be joined later in the service by Pastor Lance who will be bringing us our sermon this week. Here at Woodlawn, we're committed to maintaining our online worship service for a few reasons. First, we want to make sure that those in our congregation who are unable to attend worship in person have worship available to them at this time. And also for those who might be interested in learning a little bit more about Woodlawn and who we are as a community of faith. If you'd like to find out more about Woodlawn, you can find information on our website at woodlawnumc.net. Please join me now in reading our call to worship together. We gather together in the name of Jesus Christ, members of God's family, and brothers and sisters to one another. There are no outsiders here among us. No one has any special standing or bragging rights, for we have been brought together by the redeeming love of Jesus. Let's worship together. our prayers now together as one voice. If you have a prayer request that you would like us to be praying for, you'd like to share with the community of faith that watches these worship videos and with Woodlawn staff, you can say that now in the comments if you're watching on Facebook. And of course, you can always call the church office with any prayer requests or needs and let us know that way as well. If you're a member of Woodlawn's community and you would like to receive our prayer emails that go out each day so you can be in prayer for your community each day, call the church office and we will get you added to that email list. Let's go to God together now in prayer. Precious God, we come today in fellowship, embracing your gift of community. We come together as your family, setting aside this time solely for you. 
We set aside this time to offer you praise, to worship, to hear you speak to us and to leave this time together shaped a little bit more into the likeness of you. God, we come here to give thanks. Thanks for the times this past week where we smiled, laughed, had time with friends, appreciated the beauty of your creation, felt your peace in our hearts. For those moments when we paused to be grateful for the life you have given us. In gratitude and joy, we give you thanks for the joys in our life. And God, for the days of difficulty and struggle, when we have given less than our best, we give thanks, God, that you do not turn away from us, that we are never alone. Even when we turn away from you, you remain faithful and steadfast. We give you thanks, holy God, for your deep love for us. God, we lift up the life of the church, not just Woodlawn, but your, your global church. And we pray that we as a community might be used by you to make a difference in the lives of others. Let us be a light to shine your hope your acceptance, your love, and your compassion. And may the global church in the same way be a beacon of your hope and care for the world. God, for those who are sick, suffering, lonely, in need of your peace and presence, God, touch them with your healing and your comfort that they might be aware of your presence always with them. For the names that we carry in our hearts and the names that go unspoken and unnoticed, we lift them up to you, God. God, we ask that you continue to work in us, unite us as siblings in Christ, in ministry to and with the world. Fill us with your joy and with your hope as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Last week, we began our summer worship series, This Is Us, centered on the book of Ephesians. The overarching theme, which we discovered in the first chapter last week, is that Christians are more than simply worshipers of a good God. We are nothing less than the very family of God, God's own adoptive family. And through these remaining weeks, we'll have an opportunity to explore more about just what exactly that means. I mean, if we're more than just adherents of a religion, but are truly the family of God, what does that mean for us? And if you're a fan of the television show, This Is Us, we'll have some bonus illustrations from the Pearson family along the way. This week, we move forward into the second chapter of Ephesians. I'm going to read today from Ephesians 2, beginning at the 11th verse. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, 
and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of the household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Sometimes, we accept Jesus as the answer so much that we tend to forget what the questions are. I'll try to illustrate that with an old, old joke. Once there was a Sunday school teacher who had her class gathered and she said to them, children, I'm thinking of something and I want to see if you can tell me what it is. It's right outside the window. It's rusty red and covered with fur and has a big bushy tail and loves nuts. Can anyone tell me who I'm thinking of? The children just sat there stone-faced. Come on, surely someone knows. Finally, one little boy raised his hand. She called on him and he said, it sure sounds like you're talking about a squirrel, but I think we're supposed to say Jesus. <laughs> That's what I mean when I say we have come to accept Jesus as the answer, so much so that we tend to forget what the question is. For example, in our passage today, we might hear and land on those comforting words that Jesus is our peace. Don't you love that idea? I mean, we want nothing more than the peace of Christ, some cheer and some consolation. We may imagine Jesus as, as a, a comforting presence that holds us close and pats us lightly in the quiet moments of our lives so that we can be sent out to survive once again the world's turmoil. If we can, if we can just hold on, we think, if we can just persevere, then we'll be able to retreat back into the loving arms of Jesus and he'll wipe away all of our tears, bind up our wounds and love us back to health. The peace, the peace of Christ. However, in Ephesians, when the author writes, Jesus is our peace, I don't believe he is reflecting only upon the quiet, gentle comfort of Jesus who who wants to assure us that all is well. Perhaps the writer has something bigger in mind, something more transformative. Hmm? The clue comes, I think, in the 14th verse. For Jesus himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility. You, you hear it? We read of this image of a dividing wall, a barrier placed with hostility that Jesus comes to break down. The peace of Jesus that the writer of Ephesians is alluding to is an answer to the question of division, separation, even hostility. There's a wall that divides us and them, the in and the out, 
the strangers and the citizens, the aliens and the members of the household. And the entrenchment that happens when such division takes place makes peace nearly impossible. It would take a monumental effort to overcome such divisions, to, to tear down the walls. We need Jesus to help do that. Of course, that is exactly what Ephesians tells us that Jesus does. Jesus is about knocking down the walls, the walls that divide us, breaking down the walls of hostility. Hear it? In love, he hits so hard at all of the things that keep us separate, all the measures that we use to rise one above the other, to be better than, to be more important than, all of that gets knocked down. And not just knocked down, but destroyed, eliminated. Jesus tears down the walls that divide and breaks down the barriers so that those who were hostile, those who were enemies, might be one. One what? We already know from last week, remember? One family. One family of God. We know, of course, the measures that Jesus took to do this weren't easy. It required his blood. It meant his own death. It took everything that he had, that he poured out for us. But he did it in order to break apart and break down the dividing walls. And in doing so, he himself became broken and destroyed. The problem becomes, even though Christ has broken down all of the walls that divide us and gave his life to eliminate the hostility that exists within the family of God, what do we do? We continue to live as those, those walls still exist. We continue to live as though we're still behind those walls. And we still try to define ourselves and others as if the walls are real, as if they are there to keep ourselves and others separate so that we might be able to be with our own kind, sorting and separating and herding up behind imaginary walls. We continue to live as though within the body of Jesus, the family of God, there remain strangers and aliens, as though there are still those who are in and those who are out, as though there are those who are near to God and those who are far away. And the result of living that way is that sometimes we're the ones that are the outs, we're the ones that are the far away. To those behind the wall, we're the strangers and the aliens. We rebuild the walls that Christ destroyed and find ourselves not protected, but imprisoned. Not released to a better life, but cowering behind the very divisions that we reestablish. And that means instead of the peace of Christ, what do we get? We live in the turmoil. Forgetting that Christ already has made us one, a unified family of God. In the TV series, This Is Us, two of the Pearson triplets, Kevin and the adopted brother Randall, experience some of these dividing Walls. In fact, they've had a contentious relationship from the time that they were boys. And now as adults, uh, it continues to fester until one day it blows up into a terrible fight where both say things that each regrets. Their fight has been brewing for some time and Randall finally tells Kevin that he, Kevin, is to blame for being absent on the night that their father died in a fire. And that their father, Jack, was ashamed of him. That causes Kevin to say that 
He always thought the worst day of his life was the day their father died. But now he tells his brother he realizes the worst day of his life was the day that they brought Randall, the adopted brother, home. Hand to God, Randall, he says. That's the worst day of my life. This is what happens when people forget that they're family and they put up walls of division. The same thing can happen in church families. Or at least it was happening in the church in the earliest days when Ephesians was being written and circulated. Why else? Why else would the writer mention things like division and barriers and walls of hostility? Hmm? For the original audience of this letter, the issues were circumcision. The issues were diet keeping the Sabbath, and the complex rules and regulations of the Law of Moses. Walls were erected between the Jewish Christians who kept such laws and the Gentile Christians who did not. And the walls were put up to determine who was right, who was wrong, who was near, who was far. Hmm? Well, what are the issues for us today? Hmm? You tell me. I mean, human sexuality has become a wall in the United Methodist Church. And we've had people leave our congregation on both sides of that issue. Why? Because we sought to be one family, one, one people, even with multiple understandings of human sexuality, even with disagreement. We sought to be one family united in Christ. We sought the peace of Christ, but there were some who chose division and separation instead. In the body of Christ throughout the world, there are other dividing walls. I mean, I think of immigration, race, political identity, even, even how we respond to this virus that has, has disrupted our lives and made so many people ill and has killed over four million people around the world. Separating, dividing, hiding behind imaginary walls, calling out who's right and who's wrong, who's moral, who's immoral, who's godly, who's ungodly, who's out and who is in. On which side of the wall are you? On which side of the wall am I? Forgetting all the while that Christ gave his own life to break down such walls. That's the, that's the peace. That's the peace that Ephesians 2 is talking about. Unifying the body reminding us that we are one family in Christ. After their fight, Kevin and Randall continued to experience brokenness and separation for several episodes. One begins to wonder if they will ever reconcile. It reminds me how sometimes we can continue our own separation and division through many episodes in our own lives, even in the life of the church. But eventually, the two brothers do find a way to reconnect. And it happens one evening when they're talking about their life growing up. And Randall, the adopted brother, tells Kevin, Since I never knew who my birth parents were, I fantasized that I was a child of a family that looked like me. The father in Randall's fantasy was the local TV weatherman. The mother was the librarian of the local public library. Randall said they were the only people that I knew that I ever saw who looked like me. Randall goes on to tell his brother that such fantasies he's learned through therapy are common for adopted children. These are called ghost families. But for Randall, this fantasy produced great guilt Guilt born out of the love that he had for his family, the Pearsons. He says, picture me, Kev, going to an imaginary place that so many children go to, but thinking 
that I was doing something bad. I could never fully escape into my fantasy, Randall says, because I loved you guys too much. And this admission, how much the Pearson family meant to Randall, how much he loved them, that's the door that begins to open to reconciliation. They call each other brother for the first time in who knows how long. Kevin has moved to apologize for not understanding, not seeing things that should have been obvious in their family growing up. And this in turn leads Randall to apologize for saying the hurtful and hateful things that he had said earlier to Kevin. Dad was never ashamed of you, he tells his brother. And then Kevin is led to apologize for the cutting remarks that he made about the worst day of his life being the day that Randall was brought home. Finally, the brothers embrace, whispering to one another, I love you. I love you too. All the walls, all the imaginary walls dissipate when they remembered that they were family, that they had genuine love for one another, and that their differences, while, while still present, their differences didn't matter nearly so much as their relationship as brothers. We heard it in the text from Ephesians this morning. Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. It's when we remember that we're family, that we are related and that we have a genuine love for one another, then our differences can literally rest in peace. The peace offered through the unity that we find in Christ, which makes such peace possible. One might wonder if it's ever possible to have such reconciliation in the church today or in a church today, even a church like Woodlawn. I mean, if I, if I rolled in here a whiteboard and I asked uh, people to begin to call out all the things that divide us, all the things where we disagree, and we began to write all of these down on the whiteboard, can you imagine how quickly and how full the board would become, how, how cluttered and chaotic with all the points of disagreement? But then what would happen if for a moment we laid all of that down and we asked a different question. What if we asked, who among us is devoted to Christ? Who among us seeks to live a life in the peace of Christ? You tell me, do you think there would be any, any dissent among us? Would there be even one who would say, oh, not me. No, I, I don't belong to Christ. Jesus means nothing to me. No, of course not. Because in Christ, we're one. In Christ, we're unified. We are one in Jesus even even if we disagree on so many things, perhaps even when we disagree on everything, so long as we are in Christ, peace is possible. In the final verses of the second chapter of Ephesians, there is a vision of what that peace, what that unity might look like. With Christ as the chief cornerstone, a new temple is built. In Jesus, Ephesians tells us, 
The whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And then, in case we miss the point, the writer goes on to say, In Jesus, we too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives. Next week, we'll talk about how as adopted children of God, a vision begins to point us toward the prayers that lift us and sustain us when we are joined together as one. Receive this blessing. We are the children of God, God's own family. There are no more walls that divide us, not for those who trust in Christ Jesus. May we indeed be together, a dwelling in which God lives. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.